What happens when you realise that this whole thing isn't going to be how you expected? That thing that you've waited for and dreamed of for so long turns out to be hard. That's the challenge of today's passage where we find out what the people of Nazareth think about what Jesus has to say to them about God's priorities. Welcome to St Ninian's Church in Stonehouse. My name's Stuart and I get to be the minister here. We're glad that you could join us from wherever you are. As always, you can find out more about what we're up to at St Ninian's on our website at saint-ninians-stonehouse.org.uk. Let's listen then as Avril reminds us of the first part of our story before Douglas tells us what happens next. Later in our worship, Anne will lead us in prayer. Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 21 Then Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went, as usual, to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and announced that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him, as he said to them, This passage of scripture has come true today, as you heard it being read. Reading today is from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, and not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Last week we heard the first half of this story where Jesus stands up in the synagogue of his hometown of Nazareth and reads from the scroll of Isaiah and says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. And we read that initially the people's response is positive. You can picture them. It tells us they were amazed and all spoke well of him. But after that initial moment of approval, something changes. Have you ever been told a joke that you didn't get until later? Or watched a TV show or a film that you didn't quite understand, but the penny suddenly drops and it all makes sense? It just sometimes takes a while. That seems to be what's happening here. Jesus says these famous words, words they all know well because they're about the prophecy of the Messiah. Who doesn't want to hear about a time when everything that's wrong will be put right? 
It's the bit at the end that changes everything. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wait, what? Fulfilled? Today? Here? Now? You can almost hear the cogs turning as they work it out. Fulfilled. Today, here, now. But that means, no, it can't be. He's the carpenter's boy, Joseph's son. It can't be him. We know him. How could he be the Messiah? No, no, we're not having that. The Messiah will be a mighty warrior. How else could we get rid of the Romans? They're the ones who oppress us. Everything would be better if they just went. We could go back to how it was before. If someone could just make them go away. But the cogs keep turning. The Romans weren't always here though. There was a time not that long ago when it was just us. And to be honest, things weren't that great then either. In fact, Isaiah wrote these words hundreds of years ago and well, people are still poor. People are still excluded and oppressed. And maybe the problem isn't just the Romans. The penny drops with an almighty clatter. But what does he know? He's just Joseph's son. But he isn't Joseph's son, is he? He's God's son. But they can't see that. They can't look beyond what they think they know and realise that Jesus is different. Jesus anticipates their complaints. Sort yourself out first before telling us to shape up. And that's what we do, isn't it? We find fault in the people who find fault in us as a tactic for avoiding what we know to be true. What about it abounds? What about that thing that I said to you and you ignored? What about that time that you did something to upset me? Privilege is a word that invites our what about today responses. I wonder if, rather than saying no one used to mind when someone suggests that we should stop using particular language and thinking that it's all gone too far and it's all a bit much, perhaps we should take Atticus Finch's advice in To Kill a Mockingbird. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. So if you ever find yourself saying that kind of thing, I'd invite you to take a moment and wonder about whatever you're defending from the point of view of someone that whatever the term you think is okay is directed at. When we don't ever have to think about what we say or what we do or whatever beliefs we hold, that's a sign that we're in the privileged position. Culture is weighted towards people who look like us and think like us. And that's exactly the issue that Jesus calls out his neighbours for. You're pretty comfortable with the idea that you're God's chosen people. But your privileged position doesn't mean that you're the only ones that God cares about, the only ones that matter to God. The poor matter. Those who are excluded from society like the blind matter. People who find themselves in jail matter. The people we live well at the expense of matter. We know that. We know that the fact that there are people who can't feed their families is a scandalous plight. We know that the fact that there are more food banks in Britain than there are McDonald's is an, out an outrage. But rather than doing anything about it or what about it, he kicks in. They should get a job. They should work harder. They should stop having so many children and give up smoking and drinking. Or... We could have an actual living wage. We could all pay a little more tax. We could have a guaranteed income for everyone. And prisoners, they deserve what they get. They've done wrong. But here's the truth. A child born into life in the 10% most deprived communities in Scotland is three times more likely to spend time in prison than my kids are. 50% of prisoners in the UK are functionally illiterate with a reading age below 11 years old. Poverty and crime are absolutely linked. So whose fault is that? The pinnacle of what about today 
is to take an issue and give an outlier. Yes, but I know someone who smoked 100 cigarettes a day for 90 years and was never ill. Or we broaden the issue. All lives matter is the current favourite. Of course all lives matter. The point is that actually some seem to matter less. The poor, those living with disability, those of a different race or gender or sexual orientation. Jesus points to them. Remember when there was a famine? It wasn't one of us that Elijah fed. Remember when leprosy was rampant? It was a Syrian that Elisha cured. God's concerns are wider than ours. In fact, God's top priorities are those we often are least concerned about. And none of us likes that being pointed out to us. It makes us shuffle uncomfortably in our seats. It makes us embarrassed and ashamed. And it often makes us angry at the person who points it out. Who are you to say that to us? But there's more to what Jesus is saying than just pointing out the failures of a society that's supposed to be founded in God's love, that was born out of the release of slaves from oppression. To make things better for the poor will be costly for us. To include more people means less influence for us. To get to a point where crime isn't even a consideration because all have as much as they need and we've reconciled. It's just so beyond our imagination that we step back from the whole thing. It's just too big and too hard. We try to ignore and silence the voices that remind us that we all have a part in it. We take Jesus and metaphorically throw him off a cliff. This seems like it's only good news for our neighbours. For other people. And that offends our limited sense of fairness and justice. Equality means everyone getting the same, right? Well, no. No, it doesn't. Sometimes equality means that we all get the same, but sometimes those with less need more so that they can catch up. Justice means that people who do wrong get punished. But that's confusing justice with retribution. Sometimes justice doesn't sound fair because those who have done wrong receive forgiveness while their victims still hurt. Justice might be much more about restoring relationship between those who have done wrong and those who have had wrong done to them than it is about our need for revenge. Ending oppression means those authoritarian regimes we see on TV being overthrown, doesn't it? Well, sometimes the ending oppression means that we have to confront some hard truths about things done in our name and the ongoing consequences of that or the benefits that we've gained at someone else's expense. Jesus was our example, proof that living in the way that God wants for all of us is possible. Immediately before this passage, Jesus is tempted with three things in the wilderness. The first temptation is to think that having power over others will make things better. The second is to forget that all things come from God and that we can provide for ourselves. And the third is to put all the responsibility and all the blame for every problem on God. When we ask what it means to be more like Jesus, these are the things that we need to be better at rejecting. So how will we respond? I've spent all week thinking about the reasons why this just can't work. And the truth is, everything I come up with, they're not reasons at all. They're all whatabouts, excuses and justifications about why I don't have to change, why I don't have to try very hard or do very much, and they just don't stack up. They're all examples of where I give in to these three temptations. So I wonder if we could all dream a bit bigger. I wonder if we can all be a little more open. I wonder if we can be a touch more accepting. I wonder if we can all catch a vision of the coming of the kingdom of God and realise that there are a million and one reasons why it could never happen. But here we are anyway, still gathered around the possibility that it just might. The dream that our prayers will be answered and that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven.
gracious God, our Creator and our Source, we present ourselves today and every day in thanks for your word, your guidance and your love. As we seek to be ever more like you and more fully ourselves, we come before you in prayer. For our troubled world, torn apart by greed, by a failure of stewardship, by inequality and by disease. Help us and all those who can find new ways and new strength to help and to heal, to bring justice and your saving message to all whom we meet. For our communities, as we search for ways to break the all too familiar isolation, shine your light of love into the darkness of ignorance and distance. Help us to live and to embrace your life-giving commandment to love our neighbours. For your churches in this time of worry, as we seek to find our place in this world of competing priorities, reignite the flame of faith in the hearts of your beloved children. Help us to find new ways to spread your mission and message to a world so in need of your love. For all those in pain, all those bereaved, all those doubting, all those struggling, all those on the margins, all those searching, all those we hold in our hearts. And for our searching selves as we try to live as you tell us, we ask for your unending support to help us to be more like you and embrace who you have made us to be just as we are. For all these things we pray in the words that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's go out into the world and listen. Let's go out into the world and learn. Let's go out into the world and understand. Let's go out into the world and see Jesus. And when we go, let us speak God's love into it. We go with the blessing of God, Creator, Source and Spirit, with His all this day and always. Food Bank is open for donations every Sunday from 1pm until 2.30pm at the front door of St Ninian's Church. If you need food this week, then please come down at the same time and collect some shopping. As we step out of the current Covid restrictions, I'm glad to say that St Ninian's is open again for worship on Sundays at 11am. Please join us whenever you can. These services will continue to be online and on the telephone and available as a podcast. See the website for more details. The Kirk Session will meet on Monday the 7th of February at 7pm. We'll let you know as soon as possible if this will be on Zoom or in person. 
We're digging deeper Bible study meets on Zoom on Thursday at 7.30pm. We'll be looking back at this story from this week to see what more we can discover about it. We meet for morning prayers at 9.30am every Tuesday and Thursday on Zoom and anyone is welcome to join us. For more information about all of these things, please hop over to our website at saint-ninians-stonehouse.org.uk It has information in the events page about everything that's coming up.